I mean, you can ask how many times me and Ozzy enjoy our prostate exams. <laughs> <laughs>
every show you do, you know. So I mean, you know, whether the cameras are on or not, I mean, the whole thing is they, you know, people been bootlegging stuff since day one. I mean, nowadays with this thing, I remember with G and R when we just went out with him not too long ago. I got up and did a whole lot of Rosie with the guys, and uh, literally the minute I came off stage, we were sitting there hanging out for a couple minutes. One buddy just goes, "Hey, jackass." You want to see the performance? I go, why? What do you got? He goes, I got it right here. And Guns is playing another song right now. Like literally about maybe six minutes after I got done playing, it was already on YouTube. So it was actually pretty funny. But I mean, no, uh, when they make it in the DVD or just, you know, I always tell kids when they're always going, oh, tomorrow's my first gig or whatever. I, I just ask them, I go, well, how are rehearsals going? They go, man, the band sounds so good in rehearsal. We're really happy. And so I go, good, just do that tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. Like, you really, I mean, that's really what you got to do. It's just like, I mean, the famous saying with Ted Williams when he was going to go, you know, he was trying to hit 400. The, the ump came up because obviously <laughs> instead of staying out of the game, he stayed in. He's a real man and he uh, stayed in there. And Ted Williams could have not made 400 because he was above it, but he stayed, he decided to stay in the game. And the ump just looked at him because he, he had to get that hit at the end there. And he just he just looked at Ted Williams while he was cleaning the plate. He goes, son, in order to hit 400, all you got to do is relax. And that, that's all he and which is the truth. Instead of getting all worked up and frenzied about it, you know. So that's the same way I approach it when I'm going into the bedroom with the Immortal Beloved on 100 milligrams of Viagra. <laughs> the same way. <laughs> Um, people don't uh, necessarily think of you and uh, this power. that you hear in the background is what I hear in my brain all day long. <laughs> I got that from Ozzy. Thanks, Oz. <laughs> How did you go about picking uh, something like Game No Sunshine by uh, Bill Withers? Um, because I figured it's a hit song and it'll be able to put the wet bar in the pool that Barb wants to have for this summer <laughs> if it's a hit. <laughs> no, but, uh, no, obviously, with all the, you know, I mean, after listening to, uh, I mean, it, it's kind of funny. I mean, you know, with the tunes that you listen to, because uh, I remember going out to the Sepultura bus when, uh, when it was Sepultura. How are you going to get from Sepultura to Bill Withers? No, but, no, <laughs> but it's funny it's because it's, this would be all music that we always listen to. But I mean, it's, I remember with Sepultura, Alice in Chains and Ozzy, I remember going out to the Sepultura bus to say hi to the guys after their show. There'd be a massive party going on in the submarine in their bus. And the stuff that they were actually listening to made their own music look like the Partridge family, as if, as if you can get any heavier than Sepultura. But, uh, no, I mean, what, I, what I'd always listen to when we had like an 18-hour bus ride or, you know, we're going to be in a submarine for 16 hours or whatever for the next town after we get done doing a gig, we just always sit up in the front drinking and solving the problems of the world with, uh, and just listen to... You know, whether we listen to Marvin Gaye or Bill Withers or listening to the Eagles, Neil Young, is Elton that, John. Is that I mean, the you stuff know, you grew up on? Yeah, without a doubt. But I mean, it's just, but it's just great music. You know, so, uh, but the Bill Withers thing, you know, we'd always listen, you know, just listen to it. So I, when we were going to do it for the show, for the Unblackened thing, uh, that was in there. And also the Leon Russell song. I actually heard that first when I heard uh, Ray Charles do it. So, uh, but you know, um, it's, it's just music that we always listen to. You know, it's just timeless, timeless music. You know, I never really thought thought much about that, but you you do have like when you're doing the piano thing, like the Ray Charles inflection. You got some stuff from Brother Ray. No, well, obviously, it's, I always say it's a trickle down effect because it's obviously you can be trying to nick Greg Ullman, but you know, and then Greg got it from Ray, and then Ray, you know. So as you can see down the trickle down effect. I'm the weakest link of the whole batch, but I mean, so, but anyways, that's where it all comes from. Anybody else? Oh, good God. <laughs> Legend in his own name. Please make it Gentlemen. stop. <laughs> See, I was so flag, which is the one, dude. <laughs> um, you played on black and sitting down. Does that change the way you would approach the guitar on the solos on your comp? No, it's, uh... Do you play better than No. It's kind of, you know. No. <laughs> I'm just trying to think. There's a million ways I can answer this. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, no, Father Nick, it's just, um, well, the solos, I, I don't know. It's just, uh, no, with the Unblacker thing, we just try to keep it as, as pretty much as close to the records or whatever that we could do. But, uh, 
Oh, electric or acoustic, obviously, there's some acoustic things, you, obviously, because you don't have sustain and whatever, the, you know, you have an electric guitar, you obviously approach it different, but I mean, most of this thing, we're playing electric guitar the whole time, so. Yeah, I was sort of curious, that this, this quote, unquote, on Blood Record, like, your 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 first song is louder than anything in an R.E.M. Yeah, right. set. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> but that's why it's on black, and it's not unplugged, you know? Shit, <laughs> come on, <laughs> <laughs> DJ, I wouldn't want it any fucking other way. First of all, did you ever see the uh, documentary about, about Bill Withers, Still Bill? What's that, brother? The documentary on Bill Withers is amazing. You should see it called Still Bill. I haven't seen it yet. No. But uh, you're on tour with Gigantor. Yes. It's really it's a two-part question. One, a lot of your brothers on that band, on that Bill right now, a good lineup. How has that been going? And the follow-up is, how do you stay so damn sexy? <laughs> okay, I'll get to it. Uh, Hands it up first. Actually, uh, the, the sexy question, it just, uh, I worked my, with my uh, yoga and Pilates instructor uh, for several hours in the morning, and uh, the cologne I've been wearing is Calvin Clown, and it's uh, called Raw Prison Ass, and I enjoy it thoroughly, but uh, no, I guess the Gigantor thing is going great, I mean, because the whole thing is uh, with Father Mustaine, I haven't, you know, I've been, I've known old, you know, Dave for years, just seeing him on festivals and stuff like that, but we've never done like a tour together or anything like that. So, uh, but you know, it was like when Dave called me up and you know, it was like, Zach, it was when I have you come out on a gigantic one, and they said, I'll be great, you know what I mean? So, uh, it was definitely cool, and you know, Dave let us roll with him and everything like that. So, and you know, I've known all the guys in the band and everything like that, Father Elves, and everybody, you know, that rolls with the guys. And then, uh, Obviously, the rest of the guys on the bill between Father Draymond and you know him going out on the Ozfest doing the Disturbed thing, and Father you know Newstead with he actually played with me in Ozzy, so I mean that was always a good time. And then you got Vincenzo with the Hell Yeah Boys, so I mean there's comedy floating around all over there. So uh, no, it, it's been nothing but an awesome time. You know, one of your CDs on the CD you actually are performing uh, at a at a prison. Oh, over at the Hammerstein Ballroom or at the Guitar World offices? Is it at the is it the Guitar World offices? So, so I mean, do you have any? Is there any conflict there about performing for guys and people in jail, or do you? I mean, like these these could be like bad dudes. Oh, what? Uh, or, or is it just that you just like a captive audience? Oh no, like, exactly. Yeah. Well, the captive audience is always going to force you to have to listen to our suckage. But, uh, no, I mean, what are you talking about? Like on the DVD? Yeah. But I went over. Uh, why, you know, we got a bunch of black label brothers that are law enforcement guys. And uh, Chunk over in England, he was just. Uh, he said, Zach, we got a bunch of guys that were in for misdemeanors or something. They just trying to turn their life around and just get it together. But uh, you know, it, 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 you know, it's all win-win because it's all good because the guys are trying to get out and they're trying to turn their lives around and stuff like that. So. Uh, so, you know, so anything, you know, on a positive note, so, you know, went over there and did that, and uh, it, it was definitely cool. I mean, they, talking about the lifers and stuff, my first gig I ever did with Ozzy, that was at Wormwood Scrubs Prison. And uh, that's right, before the beard, and about maybe, I was weighing about a buck 44 then with a 27 inch waist with the long flowing locks. Put it this way, it was the closest thing to Farrah Fawcett and Hanks is these guys were gonna be seeing for an eternity. But uh, uh, that was that was quite the experience as well. But uh, I mean, the, the prison thing was, it was cool. I mean, like you said, it's for a bunch of guys that are trying to turn it around and you know get their life together. Yeah. Anybody else? <laughs> Zach, wait. Don't be who, afraid. Who gave you your first guitar? And if it was your parents, can you give us their address so we can beat them? <laughs> <laughs> I got one. What you think of the new uh, Black Sabbath CD? That's awesome, man. I mean, it's just, uh, and it's great that Rick, you know, did the record with him. It could be in better hands, because Rick is a huge Sabbath freako. So, uh, no, I just saw him the other night over at uh, the PNC Art Center, and it, it was just, you know, just so happy for him, because, you know, obviously Tony being one of my heroes, and, you know, my guitar teachers, really. I mean, you know, that's how you learn how to play guitar, it was until your heroes. So, uh, and learning all his licks and all his songs, so. Uh, uh, yeah, and it's great seeing them, and you know. But I was, the only thing I was looking, you know, the fact that they have a number one record is, it's, you know, they deserve it. They, they, you know, them, Zeppelin, and they've created the whole genre of music that we love. So the whole thing is, uh, 
you know, for them to have a number one record in like 50 state, uh, 50 countries and various planets uh, is awesome. And it's also great for the whole hard rock community in general, you know, for, so it just always opens up more doors for everybody. But uh, so it's win-win all around. But, you know, the fact that it was all packed and everything, I was just like, you know, they could look out there and go after, you know, what we created since 1969 to now, like, you know, it, it, you know, this is what we created. You know, it's, it's, it's awesome, man. I'm just really happy for him. What's next? Uh, what's next? I guess, uh, let me see. Um, hopefully they'll open up a Starbucks near our house. <laughs> uh, uh, that'd be very convenient. But uh, I guess the next thing right now, I guess uh, after we get done with Gigantor, uh, we get back in the middle of September. I mean, uh, yeah, yeah, actually, uh, probably when we're going to start the next black label out. Well. But, uh, I guess uh, now we get back in August. So I'll probably start right now, the middle of September. We'll start at the Black Loop, you know, Vatican, start recording the next studio album. So. Uh, there was a time when it was like you were releasing an album every single year, or actually like every few months in like the early 2000s. Um, did you, was a lot of, when you make an album, like, did you just have all those songs like Zeppelin used to written and you're like, okay, this doesn't fit on this record, but, oh, we can leave it for our next record? No, next I mean, because it, it is interesting that you mentioned, I mean, because like with Zeppelin, like I guess in the Zeppelin 4 sessions, they had stuff that bled over to uh, Houses of the Holy and stuff that even ended up on physical graffiti and stuff like that. But, uh, no, I mean, it's with us, I mean, it's usually all right at, you know, once we get in there and you get inspired and everything like that, you start writing like you know, like crazy. But uh, I mean, like right now, I got a whole ton of riffs and ideas and some piano things and stuff like that ready for the next album. So, but I'm sure once it's, once again it's gonna happen. Once the fellows get out there and we start tracking, and you know, uh, it's just uh, the, the drums sound like cannons and everything in the cans, the guitars, the Marshalls sound gigantic, and you know, it just inspires you to start writing stuff. You know, and it depends on you know. And I get done listening to another Zeppelin album or a Sabbath album and my Justin Bieber collection and my Lady Gaga records, you know, then you start writing riffs again. When are you going to get back together with Steel Dragon? <laughs> it's so funny, I saw Jeff Pilsen the other night and we were talking about, talking about, you know, the Steel Dragon thing. And it's just like, uh, no, when we were making that movie, it was just beyond hysterical. So, uh, and I just saw Jason Bonham not too long ago. So, and we just, we did some shows with Miles Kennedy as well, with Slash and the guy. So, uh, yeah, there was a possibility we could, you know, put that patheticness together and just bring that on the road. Uh, no. um, I'm curious, when you toured overseas, and maybe parts in the, in the United States, have you ever been told not to play certain songs or maybe change the lyrics? And if so, how did you respond to that? Wait, I can't hear you over the, the children making love in the room. <laughs> Well, what was the question? Um, when you toured overseas and maybe parts of the United States, have you ever been told not to play certain songs or maybe change the lyrics? And how did you respond to that? Wait, not to play certain songs? Yeah, maybe change your set, uh, maybe change the lyrics. Well, I mean, uh, but what to change the lyrics? Yeah, maybe there was something in Something movie. offensive? Yeah, something offensive. I just think the whole. Just us, me picking up a guitar is offensive. I think there are many people. So, or me actually singing. You know what I mean? So I think if they, if we just basically quit all together, I think they'd be pretty happy with that. But, uh, but anyways, no, I've never, I've never run into that. You know what I mean? Where you know we had to change something or whatever. You know, so you know, but uh, you know, because we are very Disney. You know what I'm saying? So. Family dance. <laughs> Any other questions? Um, has the creative process changed for you since you got sober, and how has it changed? Or... Oh, I sniff glue now, so it's, just, <laughs> it's a whole kind of different reality. <laughs> yeah. Everything kind of just melts away, just like it did with the booze, all the pain and the suffering of being me. <laughs> but, uh, he has enough residue in his beard. No, I'm going. No, but you know, I mean, the, the whole legend with the booze and all that stuff. I mean, it. You know, we'd be drinking all the time and you know, everything like that. But I was like, you know, 
I definitely remembered everything the next day. You know, I mean, so it's like people act like. I mean, put it this way: we, you know, we always had the sessions where, you know, we'd be drinking throughout the day, tracking and always playing and writing stuff like that. But you know, but uh, it'd be there like at the end of the night when we had friends over and we just like get blasted and just listen to the playback because we wanted to hear the stuff. You know, so, but uh, like in like later on when everyone would leave, you know, be like, oh, dude, I got an idea for some riffs or something. It's just like we'd end up tracking some stuff, and it's always, you know. How it always ends up with your friends. You have about 20 ideas that you think are going to change the planet, and there's about maybe one or two ideas that might be workable, that we salvageable, and the other 18 is just laughing your balls and your labia off the next day when you listen to this <laughs> bullshit that you just recorded. So, uh, I mean, it's, you know, as far as I'm concerned, no, it's it's it hasn't changed the, the way I I write or anything. I, mean, I was never like I'll do it if I'm like. Getting hammered. I remember talking to Alice Cooper, and he was like, Zach, I don't even making remember making two albums. <laughs> I, I'm like, I've no matter how blasted I got, I mean, I always remember like the next day, you know, with Father Tulinski pissing off the bar top, you know, into a couple of glasses, and I'd be drinking it, and you know, stuff like that. I'd always remember the good times. <laughs> uh, your press release points out that you wrote No More Tears, and it was, that was all your uh, writing. In your head, is the Ozzy version or the version you released under Black Label Society the definitive version of that? No, well, I mean, the definitive one is the one that we wrote with Ozzy, with, with, with Mike Inez, John Sinclair, Randy, and myself, and, and Oz. That's the definitive version, you know? So, uh, no, but I mean, Mike started off with that bass line, down the, down the, down the, John started coming in with the keys, and I came in with the slide thing, and the rest is history. And then Oz, we, we did that, you know, the, uh, the vocal riff type thing, you know what I mean? So like I sang the melody, then I came in with that riff, and then the, the song just happened. I mean, it was just like, just came out of a jam, that's all. So, you know, and the middle bit, I remember writing the middle bit on the piano at A&M, because we got up to that middle bit, and then I just wrote the piano bit, like the next day uh, in the studio, going, this would be pretty cool if we stuck this in there. And then wrote the, the middle bit, and then the part going into the guitar solo, and then the whole guitar solo section, and then uh, obviously it goes back to Mike's bass riff, you know, and then the pre-chorus and the chorus. So, no, I mean, that's how that song came about, but that's the definitive version, obviously, so. Um, this was brought up a couple of years ago, but you mentioned that you would be willing to, if Vinny and Phil ever reconciled, play in a reunited version yeah, of Pantera. I mean, well, you know, with the Pantera thing, as far as that goes, it's just like, uh, you know, I mean, obviously that's up to Vinny and Phil and Rex, you know, because they're Pantera. So, I mean, the whole thing is uh, if the guys decided they wanted to honor Dime and and do it, and they asked me, you know, because obviously Dime's my brother and I love him, and, and I was a pole bearer for him and the rest. So, like, if they asked me to do it, of course I would of course I would honor it. And you know, I'd just be, you know, woodshed 25 to 8 learning all dime stuff, you know, and then obviously he'd be with us and so when I'm in the clam or something like that, he'd be laughing his balls off, you know what I mean? So you know, asshole, you played that wrong. So, yeah, but it would be, you know, it's basically, it's, it's just, a, it would be a beautiful celebration of dime's greatness and, and what they achieved together as Pantera, you know what I mean? And, and because they changed the game, they really did. Any other questions? What is the hardest lesson you've learned in the music business all these years you've been doing this? What, the music business? I mean, it's just, uh, we were talking about, you know, the kids being here in the music school and everything like that. It's, uh, it's just so funny because out in L.A., you know, you have Musicians Institute and stuff like that. So, uh, but, you know, this one, this father was there and, you know, this kid came up. I guess he just started going there. And he was like, oh, Zach Wilde, you know, whatever. He goes, hey, Zach, man. He goes, uh, as a father, he goes, is, is it a good thing, you know, we're from Oklahoma that we have our son out here, he's studying at MI, going, yeah, of course it's a great idea, obviously he's going to be around other great musicians, you know, kids his age and stuff like that, and so, and you know, you, you're right here in Hollywood, you got all the hookers, the crack cocaine, the flow, the booze, I go, everything's here, it's one-stop shop, and I go, you know, but no, I, I was just like, uh, you know, it, 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 the great thing is, is that they teach what they teach kids in like music school even here now is they actually give them business classes. I mean, which is really, when I really look back on it when I first started, before I got the gig with Ozzy, being 19, I had no idea 
how the music business works or how, you know obviously you practice all day and you're playing and you're playing but like that's one smidgen of the whole big picture you know what I mean how you want to help your band become successful and you know I mean because I always tell kids I go that the business side of it and I go I go obviously you want to play music the rest of your life you want to play guitar all day long I go but the whole thing is if you you know the the times when you're not playing guitar, you could just invest it in the rest of your band. I should, you know, so if you if you owned a bar all day long, it would be about that bar and how we can make it successful. And then when that one's successful, then we'll start another bar in another town. You know what I mean? So it's just uh, same principle if you had a hot dog stand or anything like that. You started with a burger stand, and now we're as big as McDonald's. So you know, but they they never really teach kids that. You know what I mean? And I, and I always thought it was weird. Even me graduating high school. I had friends that didn't even know how to, my nephew, he like didn't even know how to write out a check or knows nothing about how to apply for credit cards or how to fucking get credit so eventually he can buy a fucking house. I mean, I'm just saying like, yeah, you graduated high school, I got a diploma. Big fucking deal, what the fuck, I can't fucking, I don't know how to, what about life? I don't know anything about fucking, I have no life skills. I mean, really, at the end of the day, if you really want to break it down, if you know how to read, write, add, and subtract, you fucking pretty much know what you're going to need to know, and you find out what you need, what you love. You know what I mean? So it's just like, uh, you know, but I mean, if you want to be a chemical engineer, then you have to take other things to learn, to be, you know, trigonometry and all this other stuff to learn how to do it. But, uh, you know, I mean, like Kurt Cobain, he did, it, you know, if he's not going to be trying to play jazz and trying to be Alan Holdsworth, he doesn't have to need to learn how to play fucking scales. You know, or, or Al Viola, you know what I mean? If he doesn't want to go there, I mean, you should show Kurt some bar chords and how to fucking, and Kurt will do the rest. You know, he's, he can sing his ass off and write great songs. So, you know, it, it depends on what you want to do, you know? But, um, yeah, I mean, but the fact that they show these kids like music, business type classes, because you hear about it all the time. I mean, the Harris stories, I mean, Ozzy was like, we had no idea what publishing was. We had no idea that on the rider, that when we're getting all the booze we want, and all the weed, and all the blow, and the hookers, and everything, we didn't realize we're paying for that. <laughs> Ozzy was like, we thought the promoter just really liked us. <laughs> he was a real big Sabbath fan. <laughs> you know, so, I mean, it really is kind of funny, you know what I mean? But, uh, well, I mean, because it even goes back to Ray Charles when he had the guy give him singles. You know, like the promoter, he had $100 to play the show. You know, he, like somebody, once he got like $1 bill and he said it was a $100 bill. And they're all going, hey, Ray, that's a $1 bill you got in your fucking hand, dude. And he goes, all right, so fuck you motherfuckers. He goes, from that point on, you'll, get, you'll pay me in singles. If it's 500 singles you gotta give me, it's 500 singles. That's why I know I'm getting 500 of them. So, you know, it's always a big scam, and it always is what it is, and it always will be. But, you know, but at least some of these kids have, like, a, a minuscule knowledge going into it, you know what I mean? Because it's not this all day long, you know, which is what you want it to be, but it's not. You gotta stick porn in there, and you gotta stick some other things in there, but it doesn't entertain yourself. Okay, we're gonna take uh, one more question. Yeah. The funniest Ozzy story. What's that? A funny Ozzy funny story? story? Yeah. Oh, no, I was choking off, man. But <laughs> we were just talking about it because I had dinner with the boss last night and mom. And we had, you know, our kids out. And Ozzy's the godson of our oldest uh, boy, just John Michael. So uh, we're all sitting there hanging out. But I remember Oz, one day we're just sitting around and he goes, Yeah, I was like, No. Yes, you know. I don't fucking drink anymore. I don't do fucking drugs anymore. It's fucking boring. <laughs> and, he goes, and he goes, I don't even drink coffee anymore. I don't drink tea. I don't even smoke. I never thought I'd stop that. Yeah. And he goes, oh, my dick doesn't work. <laughs> and then he, there's a pause of silence, and then Oz goes, so, why am I alive? <laughs> <laughs> Fucking awesome. Fucking epic, man. But that's just, you know, that's, that's the boss, man. Without a doubt. Well, thanks, Zach. Well, guys, cheers. Thanks for coming down and checking it out, man. Anthony and Tony from the Collective for uh, putting this uh, shindig on and uh, this man right here.
Thank you, Father Bradley. Yeah. Thank you, my brother. All right, guys. Thank you, Zach. Thank you. Thank you.